how do you pick which details go into a scene in a set like this? Because there's so much stuff here. You know, this is Andy and April. These are two goofballs. There's kegs everywhere and pizza boxes, and they decided that they're not doing dishes anymore, so they're eating out of Frisbees. Is that a Frisbee? <laughs> that <laughs> is a Frisbee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Andy Mall. Hey, what is going on guys? Welcome to Indie Mogul. My name is Ted and today we are talking about how filmmakers actually craft and create the world of a fictional story. And to talk about this today, we have Ian Phillips, who is the production designer behind shows such as Parks and Recreation, Love and The Good Place. And today we're not only gonna be talking about the process of creating a location that feels right within a story, but also talking about how to craft and create all the details that actually enhance and further that actual narrative. So let's do this. What are all of the parts that a production designer is responsible for? Wow. So everything that you see behind the actors, paint colors to wallpapers, to moldings, to artwork that's on the walls, to carpet, to how much wear and tear there is on a place, construction, set decoration, props, everything. Does it seem like it's the right time period? Is this architecturally correct? Then it has to further the story. Does it play to the story that we're trying to tell? It has to be film friendly. You have to be able to get the camera in there to get the shots that you want. Those are the most important things. Production design is just a facet of visual storytelling. Okay, so uh, I know we're going to jump into a couple of scenes. We're going to be talking about a little bit of production design here. So you ready to jump into some scenes? Absolutely. Morning, Rumi. How'd you sleep? Well, there were no bed bugs. Also, no bed. So uh, what space are we looking at here, Ian? So this is April Ludgate and Andy Dwyer's home. We're in their living room. The bones of this house are probably a 1950s house in Indiana that Burley's grandmother had owned and nothing had really been updated. Nothing had really been changed. So the cabinets were a very 80s style and the fixture that's hanging back there was very 70s. So the architecture of the house was much, much older. Of course, the carpet is sort of that nasty 70s, 80s carpet. Thankfully, that is still a stocked item at uh, a great place here in Los Angeles called Linoleum City. And you can still get it. <laughs> so if anybody wants April and Andy's uh, carpet, call Linoleum City. Where do you find furniture and pieces like this that are supposed to be dated, right? Like we're not talking about like a humongous period piece, but we are talking, you know, 56 60, 70 years ago. I do a fair amount of research and just trying to see what was available. What did kitchens look like that were brand new? It's a lot about doing research and then finding the stuff is a whole different challenge. Thankfully, I have really great decorators that I've worked with as well that not only take the time to go to these prop houses, but, you know, go to stores and find all of this weirdo stuff from, you know, the 70s. Now I have the architecture done. You know, this is Andy and April. These are two goofballs. Andy has no real drive. He doesn't really have a job. He was living in a pit and he's just kind of a disaster as a person. And you go, okay, well, he sort of lives like a lot of college students, basically. There's kegs everywhere and pizza boxes, and they decided that they're not doing dishes anymore, so they're eating out of Frisbees. Is that a Frisbee? <laughs> that, that is a Frisbee. Frisbee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the whole gag was that it was like, well, all the dishes are used up, so, I mean, we're just, we we'll eat out of Frisbees. Why not? They're not very well put together. <laughs> you know, the most expensive thing he has is a video game system and a TV that's shoved into a fireplace because they didn't have anything to set it on. Well, how do you pick which details go into a scene in a set like this? Because there's so much stuff here. It really starts with the boards that the decorator will bring together for me to sort of show me ideas of furniture that you know, we think are gonna go in there. And then it just sort of spirals from there. So, you know, maybe they did have a party. They're drinking out of red Solo cups now because they don't have any clean dishes. They don't have any pots and pans that are clean. So, 
you think, okay, well, if they don't have any pots and pans that are clean, what are these people eating? Probably pizza. So let's get a bunch of pizza boxes and we'll throw those around. How about some to-go containers? You know, you can see clothes back there. How long have they been wearing these same clothes? So you think, well, how do I show that visually? Put it in places that are visible that you think, oh yeah. They haven't done laundry in weeks. So, you know, you try and put all of those details in because you really want to sell that they're just lazy. <laughs> so, and maybe they did have a party, but they never cleaned up after it. <laughs> this, this, that's so goofy. Okay, ready to jump to the next scene? Absolutely. This is Mickey's apartment. It is a set built on stage. I, I don't um, know how people, ta can you, when you watch other production designers, can you tell when it's a set or when it's not a set? You know, the idea is to not be able to tell. Yeah, I have no <laughs> idea. I'm looking at this and I'm like, this is a set. I have been in this house. I'm like certain that I've been in this house. So I had actually lived myself in Silver Lake for uh, quite a few years. And so I, I knew these sort of duplexes quite well. I had a lot of friends that had lived in duplexes like this. We wanted to put her in a really cool sort of area that young people like to live in. And this is a very common sort of style. It's uh, the Spanish duplex. We wanted this to feel very real. So with Mickey, you always wanted to make her seem really sort of cool and fun and hip. We wanted to give her bright colors in terms of her art and her accents. She sort of had it together. And so she had bought a few things that, you know, she maybe spent some money on. Maybe she went to a thrift store and she found that chair and was like, oh, that's a really cool chair. Maybe she really liked that liquor cabinet that's there in the corner. You know, she also was a little more worldly and she knows cool people so people have given her fun gifts and those little elephants right there I think you know we said oh well maybe somebody went to Nepal and they brought her back those and it's it's all of that sort of character development that makes these characters cool and hip and fun. I kept all of the walls flat. By that, I mean there are no jogs in the walls. It's because a wall is too big and you need to break it so that you can actually take that wall out or that section of wall out. Over the table, there's a little niche in the wall with a piece of art. That is actually a camera port. Historically, in Spanish style duplexes like this, there are little niches that, you know, were built in as sort of an architectural detail. For ease of filming, on the other side of that is the bathroom. You can take that section of wall out and you can stick a camera in there. Then it looks like you're shooting in a real house. It's sort of a little filmmaker's trick to, you know, make these little portals that you can stuff a camera into in order to be able to get the exact shot that you want. So right here, for instance, did we remove the door to shoot that? Or we probably removed the doors to get the camera and the dolly into that kitchen. And then for Mickey though, do they put the whole camera team in the bathroom? What's going so, on here? For that, we took out the shower curtain and the back wall and probably the tub so that the dolly could be in there. I know this sounds like a no brainer, but how large is the camera system that we're talking about here? And why is it necessary to break away these walls? I think we used an Ari. The bodies are still fairly big. The lenses are fairly big. We used a lot of primes. Dollies. The dollies that we actually use are very big pieces of metal and machine. You have to accommodate for is getting dollies through doorways and making sure that you can have the camera get in these spaces and be able to pull walls out so that you can film the characters and make it still feel real. I think one of the things I notice when I look at a lot of these frames is just how full everything feels, right? Like there's just things, little things to look at everywhere. That's what makes spaces interesting. You don't have to build a set to make an interesting space. Space. Find a room that you can look through a couple of doors or choose an angle that you can get some depth. When you look through the hallway into Mickey's bedroom there, you're seeing not only a couple of doorways that they're standing in, but then you're looking through Mickey's bedroom door, and then you're also looking through the French doors to go outside. You can find fun angles in real locations to do exactly this. Those are the little things that that 
make a set more full and feel more real. Now, before we move on, I want to talk to you real quick about Storyblogs, which is actually our personal go-to super favorite stock footage needs website. In fact, you name it, literally every single Indie Mogul episode, any Indie Mogul episode out there, we have used it. Like when we hung out with Mike Petchy and talked about making a movie, to when we hung out with Ethan Darius and actually made an entire film using stock footage. And especially these days when it is super duper hard to go outside and shoot anything. So luckily for you and luckily for us, honestly, Storyblocks offers a super wide array of HD and 4K footage that has already been shot. And to access it, all you need is a starting membership of just $16.58 a month, which gives you, yes, unlimited downloads. And the best part is that it's all royalty free, so you won't get flagged. So head on over to storyblocks.com slash indie mobile to learn a little bit more about that. Check out some of that amazing library of footage that we use every single day. And of course, thank you again to Storyblocks. And now back to the video. So, Donkey Dunk, Jason told us about your electrician license and we have a career opportunity. Oh, Donkey Dog. <laughs> so this is the good place. And this is Donkey Doug's apartment. So again, this was sort of like an April and Andy opportunity. These are just a bunch of goofballs that live in Florida. Again, it's the video games and the bongs and the stolen signs. Donkey Doug, basically the stuff that he had in his apartment was all essentially stolen because he is a terrible person and going to end up in the bad place. What could he steal that he thought would be fun? He probably got drunk and went out and stole a road sign, then saw an open pit sign and was like, oh, this would be so fun. Let's put this up on the wall. That's probably the worst possible sign that you could steal. It's literally warning people not to fall into an open pit. <laughs> so <laughs> he is a terrible, terrible person. There's a lot of like red solo cups hanging out and like, we put in some beer cans and maybe he does clean up every once in a while. It's not as nasty as what April and Andy's was, but he certainly is very lackadaisical in his uh, cleaning. When you look for locations that you're trying to pick that match a character, what are like the main aspects or main almost like specifications? There's like time period, there's like architecture style. I think chose locations that we felt were architecturally right. They belonged in the location that they should be like this being in Florida. And, you know, we're assuming that Donkey Doug does not live in a very nice apartment complex. So, you know, we were looking for places that had bars on the windows, which you see back there. And it's sort of those extra little touches that we could have added, certainly. But if you can find it, all the better, because then you can sort of think about other parts of the architecture and, you know, make things more important and spend your money wisely. Especially for indie filmmakers, you can talk to all of your friends, talk to your family. Fine. You know, you can, yeah, that, find yeah. locations that work for you. Don't just say, oh, well, here we are in my apartment and that's all we have. There are plenty of other places that you can set things up in. If you are a filmmaker, whatever you're doing, it's a visual medium. The benefit of the Google or the internet is that you can go on and you can do research. You can find exactly what you want to create. If you want to tell a story, find those places, see what they look like. Maybe it's as simple as just changing out some furniture. I think there's, there's really inspiration everywhere and you can find that just by looking. Alrighty guys, there you have it. There's your episode of Indie Mogul with Ian Phillips on the production design and crafting of actual worlds for fictional narratives. If you like this episode, make sure you like and subscribe. And don't forget, we've also got a podcast with Ian where we actually talk about how he not only became a production designer, but also some of the design details of some of the bigger shows. So if you're interested in checking that out, we'll leave that in the link down below. Also, thank you again to Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. Unlock an unlimited library of footage by going over to the link in the description down below. But other than that, Indie Mogul, I'm Ted. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Hope you have an amazing day. And of course, we'll catch you guys next time. Indie Mogul. You know, everything is sort of single use. I think they're even sharing the spoon, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, there it is <laughs> oh, <no>. right there. <laughs>